Top Bed Talk. Nick Majerison here from October the 19th to the 23rd. It's Anesthesiology 2019. The annual gathering of the American Society of Anesthesiologists in Orlando, Florida this year. Top Med Talk will be covering the conference from day one with live streaming of our conversations from the booth and unique content. Check out our website for more details, www.topmedtalk.com. This piece is taken from the Perioptive Medicine Shared Interest Group's 2018 annual conference, Measuring, Managing and Minimising Risk, which was held in association with the Australian and New Zealand Society of Geriatric Medicine and the Internal Medicine Society of Australia and New Zealand. Don't forget to check out the show notes on topmedtalk.com for more details. Have a listen. My name's Katie Gibb and I'm a physician from Adelaide. Um, as it's 10.30, I'm going to start getting started. Can I welcome you all very much to the perioperative management in specific patient populations um, session? I'm actually really excited now to introduce our first speaker. Sunil, professor Sunil Sahai is a professor of medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Centre. He tells me he's really an accidental perioperative physician, having started off training in what was essentially going to be general practice. His undergraduate education was at Tulane University, followed by medical school at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. He then completed his residence in internal medicine and paediatrics at Texas Medical School at Houston, and he's a board certified in internal medicine, paediatrics and medical quality. He's actually on the board of SPACI, which is the Society for Perioperative Assessment and Quality Improvement. And he also has completed a graduate certificate in healthcare management um, from the Rice University School of Business. So can I ask you to join me in welcoming Professor Sunil Sahai. Well, I thank everyone for the kind invitation to speak. I want to really congratulate the conference organizers and Kate and Kirsty. Uh, I have been at perioperative medicine conferences on three different continents now, and this is by far the largest multidisciplinary conference that I've ever been to. You need to really congratulate yourselves um, for pulling this off. Um, in terms of my talk, this talk I normally have is an hour long, and I only have 25 minutes. I've posted the full slide deck to my uh, personal webpage. I'll show it at the end, and you can see it there. It's in PDF form. That's pretty much it. So let's get started. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. I do uh, write the perioperative cancer medicine chapter for UpToDate.com. I am a, a, a member of SPACI. Um, and any failed attempts of humor are mine alone, and not the responsibility of the conference organizers and or the UTMD Anderson Cancer Center. And I am from Texas. So, uh, so first, I want to talk about the multi-hit hypothesis. You need to understand that. Uh, I'm gratified that Himley Ismail was, was one of my co-authors for the most recent paper on this. He's in the audience. He's here at Peter Mack. You have a local expert in Australia and New Zealand who can help you with any questions that may occur about this. And then I understand on cancer therapy may affect the lungs and kidneys and all that kind of good stuff. And then discuss pre-existing comorbidities. Now, as I'm speaking towards the end, uh, I want you to view this as a summary of kind of what's happened in the last several days, just because uh, I'm going over stuff that's already been mentioned in the past, but I want to kind of bring it all together for you guys. You know, cancer continues to be, you know, relevant and a prominent source of morbidity and mortality. And with the number of geriatricians we have in the audience, we know that cancer is a disease of older people. Um, it, however, you know, therapeutic advances have advanced significantly. In the 15 years I've been doing this, I am now seeing patients who are returning to me on their third and fourth recurrence of a tumor and or a third and fourth primary. And I go back and look at my notes from 2006, 2007, and it's like, you know, you should be dead, but you're not because we fixed you, you know, we cured you. So, you know, what they've done is they've increased complexity for the patient. And in a system like in the United States where we're very fragmented, it's the complexity that causes issues in perioperative care. The medicine is easy. Um, of these patients who are, you know, have solid tumors, 75% will undergo a surgical resection of some sort. And regardless of the exact purposes of the surgery, the cancer patient actually has stuff that is wrong with them that you need to recognize or keep in the back of your mind. Uh, the perioptive evaluation may identify risks, uh, but you have to weigh that against um, what's going to happen to the patient. Now, the reason I want to bring that up is, is a very important point. We operate on patients with cancer for a variety of reasons. 
You want to prevent a cancer by taking out, you know, the breast before, if they're BRCA1 positive. You want to make a diagnosis. You want to obviously cure them. But what I'm seeing is a lot of patients in the last category, unrelated. These are the patients who have a history of breast cancer, older, they fall, they trip, they break their hip, and now are in the, op- uh, in the hospital waiting a hip replacement. Or the patient we have cured of lung cancer and all of a sudden needs a bypass, but we've taken out half a lung already. You know, so that population is growing, and, that, and since, being, since we've been so successful in taking care of these patients, we want to be very careful about how we evaluate them prior to going to the operating room. So I always like to say it's in the logistics. The medicine part is the easy part. If you are any competent physician, surgeon, geriatrician, whatever, you can take care of the medicine of these patients. It's logistics. If you look at all the guidelines that we have, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, surgery is defined as elective or emergent. There's nothing in between. Cancer surgery is in the middle. Usually, it's not elective because you have to cut something out before it causes a problem, and it's relatively urgent. Like you have it in um, places where there's a national health service, you may wait a year for a knee replacement. I really can't wait a year for a tumor that's doubling in size every two weeks, going to the operating room. And if I find that the A1C is 13%, I can't fix their diabetes in time. So I'm always asking my surgical team, what is my go, no go date? How far back can I push this patient before a surgical option becomes untenable? And sometimes I'm surprised where uh, with ovarian cancers, they'll say, okay, we'll give another round of chemo and get an extra six weeks. Sometimes with head and neck tumors, no, we got to go in the next week. We have no choice. So it's always a matter of discussing this with the patient and making the best compromise you can make. So preoperative diagnosis testing, you all know from the literature that testing patients before surgery is usually worthless in most cases. You know, um, prior to my hiring at MD Anderson, because I'm an internist by training, and I know internists across the world, we would track down the actual reason because the TSH was 3.5% above normal, and we would cancel a case until we knew why the TSH was elevated. You know, but that's not going to help the patient. We're not going to go on a safari. Our job is to get the patient to a surgical option that may be curative. Uh, conventional wisdom is, you know, you don't order the test if it doesn't change your management. At MD Anderson, we think differently. We order the test because it may change. It may not change your management, but it will may change how we treat the patient in the future. Uh, at our clinic, at, M- at a cancer hospital, everybody gets a lipid panel. Why? Because I intend to cure them of cancer and not have them die of a heart attack in five years' time. And we put them on statins for surgery if the lipid panel is elevated. The EKG, chest x-ray, and the chem, everything, we call the chem everything. Basically, the lab gives you 20 values. We, or- we do that test because, um, just to make sure we have uh, something available. But the majority of the time, all that stuff's already in the chart. We have that information available. We're not sticking the patient again for no other reason. So the multi-hit hypothesis uh, for cancer care is what I want to get across to you. Our patients are deconditioned, and they're deconditioned because of chemotherapy, radiation, sarcopenia, previous medical issues, fatigue, just cancer. Uh, it is a big issue that affects patients, which is why we're really pushing the prehab aspect at MD Anderson. Bernie and Emily are doing a great job pushing prehab at Peter Mac. They should be a model for the country as far as, or nation, world as far as I'm concerned. So I have a case presentation. Ms. Uh, Uhura is a 70-year-old woman with uh, non-small cell lung cancer with metastatic disease to the bones. Her past lung history is well control hypertension, diabetes. This is an actual patient, and the name has been changed, obviously. She is a retired communication officer, and she received chemo two months ago, but had an impending pathologic fracture of the hip. She went in for hip replacement. 72 hours after surgery, I'm the physician on call. I don't have registrars. I don't have residents. I don't have residents. They call us directly. I get waking up at 1 o'clock in the morning saying this patient has chest pain by the orthopedic resident or registrar. You know how useless they are in most medical aspects. The, he was smart enough to or she order a CT angiogram, which is negative pulmonary embolism. EKG showed Q waves, which actually surprised me, but he told me the computer read out the Q waves, not him. Um, but what woke me up was a troponin T of 496 nanograms per liter. If you've ever done an acute MI workup, at least based on these labs, uh, acute MI is a high sensitive troponin of 50 or higher. This is 10 times what a normal heart attack should be. What happened? 
It really, I mean, this woke me up. I mean, I, I, I tend not to wake up very quickly these days because I'm older, but this woke me up. So she received a drug I cannot pronounce called Catrida, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor two months ago. Dr. Allison, who just won a Nobel Prize on this, and according to his colleague in, in Japan, what in the hell are immune checkpoint inhibitors? You know, we've been dealing with them for years, but what they are is basically drugs that shut down the negative regulatory pathway of T-cells. Cancers have learned to shut down T-cells. We've turned that off, and what happens is the T-cells are no longer handicapped. And for those of you who work in the cancer realm, you know it's amazing. Tumors just melt away. Solid tumors like lung cancer, melanoma, just melt away. These patients are cured 10, 15 years out. They should have been dead three years, you know, but they, they even melt away. So, but sometimes the T-cells don't stop at killing the cancer. They move on. So something called immune-related adverse uh, uh, effects, which are very common. Basically, if you want to learn it, Latin name of the organ plus itis. That's what they cause. That's the easiest way of teaching it to you guys. You know, whatever is an itis, it can be caused by immune checkpoint inhibitor. And you have to have a very high inhibition to make sure that it's not going on. Um, basically, what, there are some timelines, dermatologic effects, like rashes occur in the first few weeks. But most patients will end chemotherapy and have a six-week recovery period before going to the operating room for whatever reason. You're dealing with hepatitis, hypophosphatus, and pneumonitis in that per- time period. And up to 24 weeks out, you can have an itis of something. And if you find something wrong, you need to call for help because it is just too complicated for us as paraprofessionals to deal with. We need help from the oncology team for that. So moving on to the more traditional talks, chemotherapy and cardiomyopathy issues. And I'll go a little bit faster. The whole talk is available on the, again, on the website. Basically, we know chem- car- chemotherapy causes cardiomyopathy. The nice thing to know is that it's more or less class-related. If you know the class, you know what to deal with. Um, Taxanes, uh, anthracyclines have been the most famous ones, but there are taxanes out the newer agents, the TKIs, the nibs and abs, they all cause issues in treatment. And you have to have a high inhibition of that happening. So what I'm doing is uh, the targeted chemotherapy has gotten made things a little bit worse because there are monoclonal antibodies and stuff that I can't pronounce that cause uh, issues with patients. And um, the way kind of we address the issues is looking at the drug the patient received and kind of guiding our question to, do you have these, uh, these symptoms? So um, one question I ask every patient who's had new adjuvant chemotherapy is, did you have chest pain during or after a chemotherapy and infusion? Because there are agents that can cause coronary ischemia, coronary vasospasm. You may, under, you may highlight or may find underlying critical coronary disease by the coronary vasospasm. So we work those patients up. Radiation therapy is very common in, you know, in the neoadjuvant field for patients. Unfortunately, it fries the heart and it fries the conduction system. Uh, and you can cause vascular disease, you can cause conduction problems, you can cause uh, sclerotic artery. Now, granted, with radiation therapy, the delays can be five to seven years out, and that's where you need to be a bit more cautious because the patient who's in the active treatment cycle will not, res- will not have these issues. The patient who's seven years out from mantle cell lymphoma radiation will have disease issues. One of the things that we uh, found at MD Anderson is something called radiation-induced carotid stenosis. 20 years ago, that disease did not exist because every patient who had head and neck radiation cancer died in five years. Now everyone's living 5, 15, 20 years out, and we're learning we're frying their carotid arteries in the middle of while we're doing this. And um, it, it really can't be fixed with a stent. It has to be actually surgery put in. So the, uh, the slide goes over the whole radiation therapy side effects. Again, I'm going to fly through some of the slides really quickly, but I want to talk to you how I approach a cancer patient. This is an amalgamation of how you would approach a typical patient undergoing a hip replacement and having cardiac symptoms. First of all, are you having symptoms? If the answer is no, they're going to the operating room. I'm not going to go any further. But if they are having symptoms, the next question I have to ask is, did your symptoms precede the treatment we offered you? Were you short of breath and having angelic symptoms six months before we started doing anything? If the answer is yes, we do normal testing. If the answer is no, the next question asks is, what did you have? And the patients don't have no clue, honestly. You have to dig in the chart to figure this out. If the patient had a, a, an agent that I know to cause cardiotoxic effects, then I start looking. If the answer is no, I put it down to usually chemotherapy, induced fatigue, and move on to the operating room. So take-home points are basically, in a previously healthy patient, if there were no indications to do a stress test or an echocardiogram prior to surgery, there's no need to go looking any further. But if we did something that may have harmed their heart or CV system, 
then we need to move on and do further evaluation of these patients. And the nice part is the treatment's the same. It doesn't matter if it's cardiotoxin-induced anthracycline uh, heart failure or just plain old ischemic heart failure. It's the same medication. So that part makes life a little bit easier. Um, the pulmonary system, there are agents that do cause pulmonary side effects. The big one that we've noticed, or what we call the TKIs, they cause giant pleural effusions. We have to drain them before surgery. Uh, bleomycin, for those patients, we need to have... Um, just keep the lowest FiO2 possible, which I've mentioned on this slide. And again, we all know PFTs don't do diddly squat for patients before surgery. We always have them stop smoking, and they don't know why, you know, um, and then work on routine lung uh, expansion um, maneuvers. Uh, I order, we, I see approximately um, 100, 150 patients a month. I order maybe two, one stress test and probably three or five echoes. And I'm ordering the echoes, I'm looking for aortic stenosis and pulmonary hypertension. That's all I'm looking for, nothing else. Um, the GI system, uh, you know, nutrition is very important. It's been mentioned multiple times this conference before. We need to optimize patients with nutrition. Malnutrition due to the chemotherapy, malnutrition due to the tumor burden, malnutrition due to inability to absorb nutrients because you're throwing up your guts all the time. We really need to work on that. And, uh, and Albion 3.5 or lower, an independent risk factor for um, uh, post-op pneumonia. A low albumin is also a risk factor for poor wound healing, which equals wound infections after surgery. So we really need to work on getting patients optimized in the nutritional phase. And we, do, we try to do that at MD Anderson. Every patient having a major surgery where we feel the nutrition status is not up to snuff, we have nutrition to see those patients. And sometimes they're very difficult conversations where the patient doesn't want a feeding tube, and you know the only way to fix them is by putting a feeding tube them and getting high-protein getting high uh, in, drinks into them as quickly as possible. Uh, hepatic disease, again, same issues. The liver itself is the workhorse of the body for most parts. You see coagulopathies, you see nutritional deficiencies, vitamin K deficiencies. It's, it's a pain, so we want to evaluate the liver very carefully before surgery. Um, and again, chemotherapy can affect the liver. Most of the time, it's not going to be an issue, but you really don't want to take a patient to the operating room with increased liver function tests unless you know why they're increased. If they're increased because they started a statin, that's very different than being increased because they, they got an uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor that's shutting down the liver. Uh, endocrine system, the main issue that we deal with with endocrine is diabetes. Everybody has it worldwide. It's normal, you know, uh, typical management is the same. However, there are patients who receive steroids a, as an adjunct to their chemotherapy, or they have a brain tumor and are getting steroids to reduce the swelling. Those sugars, we do, we do our best to control them. Again, in cancer care, you do not have the luxury of delaying by six months to fix a hemoglobin A1C of nine. We document it and we fix it after surgery because we don't have, uh, don't have the, we don't want to delay the patient's care. Um, that's already mentioned. Carotene plus disorders. The biggest thing we have is SIDH, low sodiums. For all practical purposes, at our in our center, if the sodium is 128 or higher and it's been stable, we go to the operating room. I rarely cancer surgeries for a low, an unexpected low sodium uh, because it just, most of the time you can't fix it uh, in time before surgery. Hypercalcium malignancy does occur, and these are usually the patients who are coming in emergently because they come in confused, you work them up, the calcium is 15, and you figure out they have a cancer, you know, and then you have to fix them. So that part usually is addressed before they hit the pre-op clinic for us, the majority of time for patients. Kidney issues, we have, um, you know, the kidneys, again, my brother's a nephrologist. He thinks it's the smartest organ in the body. Um, it is uh, a major source of frustration for us sometimes because chemotherapy is toxic to kidneys. Uh, it just shuts them down, you know. And then if you're having, I've had numerous conversations with patients, you're already coming in because you have advanced renal cell carcinoma. You've got, in cardio, you've got a nephrotoxic chemotherapy. Your GFR is marginal, and now we're going to cut one of them out. And surprisingly, our urologists don't have this conversation about you will wake up on dialysis. Uh, and you have to have that conversation documented someplace because some patients don't want dialysis. You know, uh, so, and unfortunately, despite our best efforts worldwide, there is no good risk prediction tool for kidney failure in the postoperative setting. Blood, we see a lot of this. MD Anderson is a you know, World Arts Cancer Center. We divide patients um, between solid and liquid tumors. Liquid tumors are uh, leukemia and lymphoma uh, tumors. So we will occasionally see the patient who has fallen and gotten uh, admitted to a hospital, and they do a CBC, and the white counts 100,000 on acute blast crisis. 
but they have a bone to fix because they fell down. And that's actually a very uh, difficult situation to address because you don't know what to do. Do I fix the leukemia first or do I fix the hip first? So what we had in tempting these patients is we work on uh, a multidisciplinary team. We talk to everybody, making, making sure it happens. Uh, excellent talk is to about anemia. Anemia in the, in the cancer patient is a pain to deal with. Uh, it really is, uh, because they can be anemic for 15 different reasons. Uh, our main job in the pre-op center is to identify that anemia exists and come up with a strategy around anemia management. And again, we only have a couple weeks usually beforehand, so, and we don't use IV iron at our institution just because we never got uncomfortable with using it. Um, and we don't have the new, we don't have the new formulation that you can do that reduces the uh, risk of anaphylaxis. Uh, but as I'm mentioning about liquid tumor requiring surgery, if your white count's over 100,000, you're going to sludge your white cells inside your vasculature, and you're going to cause strokes and also respiratory failure and also bleeding and thrombosis and infection. So for those patients, we're doing chemotherapy, or we've actually done this emergent leukophoresis before hip replacement, just to get that white count down to less than 50,000. Play the counts, same thing. They sludge up the system, cause strokes, and bad things can happen, and they can be side of contumor. Again, we put, if we have time, we put, if they're not that high, we put them on angiolide hydroxyurea. But however, if they're running... Two million, three million, we have to uh, play to face these patients before they go to the operating room. Uh, post-operative care issues, um, got five minutes left. Um, you know, we all know extended DVT prophylaxis works. I use, this slide is literally uh, 12 years old, the Ristos trial, which proved that there was a, you know, bump that occurred at day 25, day 26 from cancer surgery, um, and why we do extended DVT prophylaxis in all patients at MD Anderson. Most of our patients are all high risk. Uh, the ASCO guidelines, we follow them judiciously. The conversations that happen in this space are now, I can't afford the injection because they don't have any coverage, or I, you know, I can't afford uh, to stay for a month, or I can't be followed up. We put those patients on DOAX because uh, in the United States, at least, the ins- private insurance companies have priced the DOAX at a lower rate than injectable lumacrate heparin. So sometimes we need to choose that for extended prophylaxis. There's no data out there at all for that, except for in the orthopedic pr- population. Uh, we actually calculate risk scores for everybody, and if they qualify, we put them on. I actually had a patient many years ago who had a preoperative pulmonary embolism when the cancer was diagnosed. She had a Whipple. We cured her of a cancer. I personally wrote the prescription for 28 days of an oxaparin to go home on. Day 31, she had a saddle pulmonary and died. It just is, you know, devastating when you hear that happening. And there is some talk now in the cancer world about should we do something from day 30 to day 60 for these patients. Uh, the data is still not clear yet. Uh, postoperative infections, again, if you have a bad nutritional status going in, you're not going to heal. If you got a vast in chemotherapy, you're not going to heal. You know, it's, if you have poor diabetes, you're not going to heal. So we try to focus as much as we can on the pre to address these issues. A lot of these things are unmodifiable. We cannot modify a lot of these risks. What we can do is identify that the risk exists and watch the patients like a hawk to see if there are, if there are any issues that may develop. Um, prevention and management, basically, what you need to do, periopid antibiotics, control hyperglycemia, pulmonary toilet, the, the stuff that we all do very well because we've learned how to do it very well. It's not any different for cancer patients. Uh, and as I mentioned about poor wound healing uh, about for patients, and that's the, pretty much the talk I have. Uh, I do have a shameless promo, again, with Spacky. If you guys are wanting to escape Australia in February, uh, we're in the Walt Disney World Resort. Um, bring your families. Uh, it's an awesome conference. At, we, until this conference, we were the largest in the world. Uh, so, uh, uh, but it is a very good conference, and, it, and, and we, SPACI itself benefits from its international membership. Again, thank you so much. <laughs> it's Desiree Chapel here. Just a quick reminder, subscribe to Top Med Talk. We're a daily source of news and conversation focused on perioperative care. We bring you all the latest talk from all the major conferences in the perioperative space. We can also be found on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we now have a free mailing list with special offers and additional goodies for subscribers. Go check us out at topmedtalk.com. That's www.topmedtalk.com.